Okay. All right. Um, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julianne. I'm another uh, pharmacy resident here at UMC. Um, I'm from Texas Tech, so I grew up in Texas. So that's my background. Um, today we're going to talk, or I'm going to talk about ceftolozane, tazobactam, plus metronidazole for complicated intra-abdominal infections um, in this phase three trial. So if you're not familiar with what complicated intra-abdominal infections are, they're just an infection that um, extends beyond the original peritoneal space and is associated with mostly abscess formation or peritonitis. These types of infections are polymicrobial um, with most common being facultative or aerobic gram-negative gram -negative infections such as E. coli, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, um, Proteus, and Enterobacter. You also have other agents such or other pathogens like anaerobic species like Bacteroides or Clostridium and your gram-positive aerobic cocci like Streptococcus and Enterococcus. The Surgical Infection Society and IDSA recommend um, single agents such as meropenem or Piperacillin, Tazobactam, or Zosin for your complicated infections with Pseudomonas or a combination of metronidazole with ceftriaxone, cefotaxime, cefepime, and ceftazidime um, are their recommendations. So this new novel, Cephalosporin, is ceft Ceftolazone, ceftolazane, tazobactam, um, and it covers Enterobacter, E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus, Bacteroides, and Streptococcus, and um, one of our biggest agents or pathogens is Pseudomonas, so that's new for a cephalosporin class. Since it is a cephalosporin, I'm not really positive where, which class it's associated with, I couldn't find that, but it is bactericidal, it inhibits cell wall biosynthesis, and inhibits pro penicillin binding proteins of Pseudomonas and E. coli, giving us that extra uh, coverage. The previous studies that have been done with complicated intra-abdominal infections with this agent was with met metronidazole. Um, they did show a cure rate of 83.6 to 90.6%. Um, however, that phase two trial did not show, um, did not have power to show efficacy compared to meropenem. So this is kind of why they wanted to try this phase three trial. Um, same, we're going to compare it with meropenem and complicated intra-abdominal infection, but we have a much larger patient population to meet power. So their study goal, again, was to demonstrate statistical non-inferiority um, in cl clinical cure rates with ceftolazine, tazobactam, plus metronidazole versus our meropenem. And it is supported by Merck Pharmaceuticals, which was the manufacturer of the drug. The study design, it was two identical multi-center prospective Randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial that was initiated in December 2011 until the end of enrollment of September 2013. They enrolled a total of 993 patients with complicated intra-abdominal infections. Um, they had about 487 in the ceftolazine, tazobactam, metronidazole group, um, and 506 in the meropenem group. They included patients that were greater than 18 years of age. They needed to have clinical evidence of complicated intra-abdominal infection which was confirmed by um, operative or percutaneous drainage of an infection focus within the last 24 hours. They excluded patients that had complicated intra-abdominal infection managed by stage abdominal repair in which the fasciae was not closed, or if they had low likelihood of adequate source control during surgery, which would <coughs> increase your risk of um, other types of infections. They also excluded anybody with a creatinine clearance less than 30 and um, any use of systemic antimicrobial therapy within the last 24 hours um, of the first dose of the study drug unless the treatment failed, so they needed the study drug. They categorized patients into um, intent to treat mycobiologically, intent to treat clinically evaluable and microbiologically evaluable. Um, so that was kind of their primary and secondary endpoints. Their primary endpoint was looking at this statistical non-inferiority at the test of cure visit, which was between 24 and 32 days from the start of therapy. Um, and the microbiologically intent to treat group was any patient that met the baseline characteristics um, and had one baseline pathogen that was susceptible to the study drug. And then their secondary endpoint was looking at the microbiologically evaluable patients that um, met all of the protocols of the study and had a susceptibility to the study drug. So we're looking at the cure rates between these two types of um, analysis populations. And they needed to meet a non-inferiority margin of 10%. 
So they gave these patients uh, ceftal ceftolazane tazobactam 1.5 grams plus metronidazole 500 milligrams every eight hours versus meropenem uh, one gram every eight hours plus a placebo um, between four to 14 days. The 14 day therapy were the more severe patients with multiple abscesses, um, peritonitis, failure of prior antibiotic therapy, um, and our hospital acquired infection. Their statistical analysis, they needed 90% power to adequately have a sample size to demonstrate this 10% non-inferiority margin, um, and then their non-inferiority Hypothesis tested through two-sided 95% confidence interval approach in which the lower bound difference of the confidence interval needed to be more than negative 10%, I'm sorry, less than 10% um, percentage points and then non-inferiority could be claimed. Their baseline characteristics, um, they had about one-fifth of the patients were at least greater than 65 years of age, a third had renal impairment, and more than 80% had peritonitis. The most in frequent infection site was the appendix, and the most frequent diagnosis was appendiceal perforation or abscess. This was mainly done in European patients with about 77%. Uh, about 10% were from South America, and about 7% were in North America, or 5% were from other countries. And the most po common pathogen was E. coli at about 65%. Um, you also had Klebsiella and Pseudomonas at 9% each, and 7.2% had ESBL producing Enterobacteriaceae um, isolated. Their primary endpoints, um, they had the clinical cure rates of the difference between 84% in the Septolazane group versus 87.3% in the Meropenem group in their MITT uh, patient population at 27 days of their test of cure which did meet non-inferiority. Uh, if you'll see there at the confidence interval at negative 8.9% was less than negative 10. So they did meet non-inferiority there. And then again, at the end of the study um, in December or September 2013, uh, they still had the clinical cure rates of 89.2% and 92.3% meeting non-inferiority at negative 7.23. Their secondary endpoints um, with the microbiologically evaluable patients, you'll see they're at 94.2% in the septolazine group and 94.7% in the meropenem group. Um, so pretty similar cure rates there, and they did meet non-inferiority again with a negative uh, 4.52 confidence interval. Um, I did want to mention the subgroup analysis that they did with our high-resistant pathogens like Pseudomonas. They did have a 98.6% in our ceftolazine plus metronidazole group compared to 89.9% in our meropenem group. Um, and again, you'll see the higher rates or similar cure rates in both these study groups with enterobacteriaceae and our ESBL producing. Um, however, I put in the patient populations that actually had these infections, so um, you'll kind of see it compared to the rest of the population of the study, it's, it's quite small. When they were looking into safety of this drug, um, they had adverse event rates in both groups pretty similar, about 44% in the septolazine group and 42% in the meropenem group. Their most common laboratory adverse event was increase in LFTs. And um, septolazine, tazobactam had more GI issues like nausea and diarrhea with seven to 6% in each one of those. They also had hypokalemia. Um, associated more than in the meropenem group. Other adverse events that happened in more than 2% of the patients in the study were vomiting, pyrexia, insomnia, headache, anemia, and hypertension. Um, however, when they compared all of these adverse events compared to meropenem, there was no statistically significant difference between each group. So in conclusion, um, they did result that septolazine tazobactam plus metronidazole is a potential alternative to the current recommended antimicrobial, such as meropenem, for the treatment of complicated intra-abdominal infections, um, especially if enterobacteriaceae or pseudomonas are su suspected. And as according to the strengths and weaknesses of this study, I did see, I did think that it was a very large sample size and multi-centered compared to their phase two trial, which kind of gave them a little bit more um, statistical power when checking for assessing non-inferiority. Um, and they did, they did have a, quite a big range of severe patients um, that they were, they didn't include. However, weaknesses, majority of these patients were based in Europe, so um, you kind of have to take that in mind when you're assessing your patient. It is a different po patient population. They may have different resistant rates as well. 
than um, what we experience here. Uh, like I mentioned before, it was a small sample size of this resistant Pseudomonas population, which is kind of what their claim to fame is right now, is um, treating the Pseudomonas, resistant Pseudomonas. So, um, so it is still an option, but the data of that large of a population is just not there. And uh, they didn't mention any central laboratory for all the centers. So um, when they were sending back these clinical cure rates or susceptibility rates, it uh, was bas basically out of their own laboratory. So there could be kind of um, conflicting data with that. As far as applying this to practice, um, it does have Pseudomonas bacteria efficacy. Um, however, like I said, we, do, we do might need larger populations in the study. Um, but as far as here at UMC, the meripenem susceptibility report is 84 for Pseudomonas. So that kind of gives you an idea of if a patient already has been on meripenem and it is Pseudomonas or they've tried other treatment options, maybe this could be an option for these high resistant cases. Um, also, when looking at cost, one bottle of this septolazine tazobactam is $83. So if you're giving that three times a day, that's going to be about $250 a day, um, plus the metronidazole that was tested. And then compared to meropenem, that's about $60 a day for therapy. So um, just a little bit cost difference as well. Um, and that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions? Yes? Uh, do you know we have any data out there on the drug for Yes, it is um, indicated. I didn't get to look at the studies for the complicated uh, UTI. It, it has an indication for that. Also has indication for ventilator-associated pneumonia, which they are um, enrolling patients right now with the, that indication. So we'll see how those results pan out. Yes. Um, so I think a, a common thing that we're going to see um, because this drug is combined with tazobactam is a lot of people will say, well, why do we need metronidazole with septolazine and tazobactam, but we don't need it with piperacil and tazobactam for intradoc? Can you, you know, yes. kind of enlighten us on that? Yes. So in the phase two trial, the only thing I could find was in the phase two trial, they left metronidazole addition up to the provider. So in that phase two trial, 90% of providers added metronidazole. So that was the only thing of why they included, it was just been studied. That's what they studied and that's what they found the cure rates with. When I looked at what um, ceftolazine tazobactam actually covers compared what you would be concerned about in complicated intra-abdominal infections, the only um, pathogen that I found was that it didn't cover clostridium. So I'm not, that, that's the best answer I could give honestly, was that it was just studied with metronidazole, and that's where we found these clinical cure rates. Yes? So, you got a 95% cure rate for yes. ESDL. <coughs> Would you use this drug for ESDL? If it had um, already had failure with a carbapenem, um, So what did ESBLs knock out as far as antibiotic capacity? I'm sorry, what? What did ESBLs chew up as far as antibiotics go? Well, it is beta-lactamase inhibitors. <laughs> so, um, it, I mean, the only agents that you could use for ESBL right now are carbapenems. So I, that's why I, it has activity, but I'm not really sure with everybody, I guess. It, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, this is one of those where I hate when they put it in study mm -hmm. because it gives people a false sense of confidence as far as what to do. They got 95% cure rate because they went in and they did a surgical brain and just requirement for studying. Uh, the right. taste of that, by definition, it didn't see it done. Yes. Except is going to be chewed to pieces. Right. Um, and the problem is, is that the major players as far as ESPLs go, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel super comfortable, especially just the patient population. It just doesn't match what we have and things like that. Is 
Is there any other questions? All right, well, thank you for listening to us. <laughs>